Hello traders, this is John Kickletter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Well, we have a lot of fundamental activity going on and a lot of technical patterns that are setting up and uh, getting into a position that it looks like, uh, given a number of certain developments, we might have some great trade opportunities, perhaps even a significant change in the backdrop of market condition, meaning more active uh, markets versus less active, or the development and persistence of trends versus uh, back and forth and uh, congestion. Uh, but as we monitor and as we uh, look for the substantial changes which can offer uh, for most of us a better uh, trading background, it's important to remember something. One, don't project what you would prefer. Uh, instead, trade with what's in front of you. And that means remaining flexible and keeping close tabs on those cues that would say that, yes, we are transitioning in our market type. But in this strategy video, I want to talk about something else that is extremely important uh, in the uh, standard status quo market versus a transition market. It's the same, and that is always uh, attempting to pick the simple trade. All right. I'm sure you've heard the uh, KISS, the K-I-S-S, -S, uh, if you've been in markets long enough. It's also uh, an axiom for uh, generally anything one learns in life. Uh, it's K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. All right, not to mean anybody's stupid, but this is a saying that it is supposed to be relatively straightforward. Otherwise, if you introduce too many complications or variables into what you're doing, there are too many things that can go wrong. If I have to thread a course in which five things must occur before I can have, let's say, a profitable trade on my hands, that is five opportunities for something to go wrong. Four things may work, and that fifth can put it off. Now, of course, you can find situations in which of those five various considerations, uh, four are only important. The fifth is uh, more a contributing factor, or it's going to be out of the way. Uh, but you're talking about getting into a much more complicated situation. Uh, and you can't simply uh, ignore the complications in the market to make it simplistic for your, uh, for your uh, convenience. You have to take into, into consideration those things that are actually important for trading. All right. Now I'm starting off here on the Aussie Kiwi because its technical pattern is relatively straightforward. Also, as I've said many times before, the Aussie Kiwi is one of those currency pairs which few people will pay attention to, but it is very straightforward. All right. Fundamentally speaking, it is uh, one of the most balanced currency pairs you're going to find. Do risk trends come into play here? No, they're both considered uh, carry currencies. Do commodities come into play? Obviously, both are commodity producers. Uh, how about the influence of globaliz globalization versus protectionism? They're both trade. Uh, they're both trade-oriented economies, heavily dependent upon China. There are so many commonalities between these two currencies that they neutralize a lot of the variables, really putting forward one concern, and that is what's the economic and interest rate potential for one versus the other. That makes for a relatively simple fundamental interpretation, and oftentimes the technicals reflect that. This is a very simplistic currency pair versus uh, the overly complicated currency pairs uh, that we have out there. And uh, of those, there are many. Uh, the euro pound, for example, is arguably one of the most complicated currency, pair, uh, currency pairs now. Uh, technically speaking, we've had head and shoulders pattern turns in, and turned into range patterns. Uh, we've had extreme volatility uh, turn into uh, periods of abject lacking uh, volatility. Uh, we have a fundamental backdrop which is highly complicated. We have Brexit which is uh, ongoing and both are engaged. The European Union is an umbrella for the Eurozone uh, but we have on the other end of the European Union side of the table we have the UK obviously trying to uh, push forward with their divorce. Uh, Brexit is presumed to hurt the UK, but clearly it's not just a UK issue. Both 
currencies are on the hook for this separation. Who's on the hook the most? Who stands to lose the most? Well, that's a debate. That's not particularly straightforward, and that answer is probably going to change with time and circumstance. This is a very complicated currency pair, and very much the opposite or contrast to the Aussie Kiwi. Now, when we're looking at simplicity versus uh, complexity, uh, there are certainly a lot of factors that go into it, but generally this should be applying to uh, both simple versus complicated technicals and simple versus complicated fundamentals. Typically speaking, in technical terms, which is, I think, most people's preferred analysis technique, uh, I think trend lines and zones, maybe moving averages and Fibonacci retracements, uh, these simple tools are some of the best. I'm a, uh, I'm a lifelong technical uh, trader. I've always, uh, I started with technicals and I've always in, in incorporated technicals into my decision making. But I have to say that uh, over the years, I've gone from purest uh, cult-like believer of technicals and its power uh, into a more practical uh, user of the analysis technique and I would find that I was actually deluding myself in presuming that I can use a technical uh, assessment like that on gold one week chart trend line there all right that I could use technicals and uh, it would be a reflection of a subconscious of the masses and I can pull the wool over everyone else's uh, eyes or uh, more appropriately I can take advantage of something that nobody else can see which is frankly ludicrous technical analysis in its most simplistic is a very obvious technical development in which many people can respond to it so many uh, as as obvious as technicals can get, uh, drawing in more than just the retail chart traders, uh, if you can get, let's say, uh, funds or central banks to respond to a very basic trend line, that is a lot more capital. And we're talking about a, uh, a systemic increase in the amount of liquidity that can back the importance of that technical level. Simplicity, simplicity is always going to generate a lot better response from the market when it comes to technical analysis. Now, in terms of fundamentals, we can have very complicated assessments of essentially a bottom-up uh, technique, uh, which I see very frequently when uh, questions are posed to me. Uh, well, what do I think about any individual indicator out there? All right, what about UK construction? Uh, what does this mean for the UK economy? What can it, how marginal of an impact can it have on interest rate expectations? How can this uh, form or shape Brexit considerations? In essence, what we're trying to boil down is what very mild adjustment can this make to the big picture uh, fundamental theme? Well, realistically, we don't want to be that nuanced because the, the trades are so marginal in that case. Or if we get to a very important big picture topic, but the implications are too many complications. We have to thread that same path of many necessary steps, then it's very unlikely to be a, pro a profitable trade. Why? Because the probability, remember our conversation about probability potential, our probabilities diminish. What we should be looking for, fundamentally speaking, in, in turn, is uh, something that's relatively straightforward or is big picture, and the masses can push it one way or the other with a particular outcome. This is why I typically, with the start of most conversations fundamentally oriented, uh, speak on themes, monetary policy, risk trends, political uh, or geopolitical issues, trade threats. These are big picture concerns. They carry big picture influence, and it is easier to not just monitor, but it is easier to trade. All right. Now, in simplicity, I want to point out a, a warning. Don't try to oversimplify. And I know that that, that seems 
contradictory. But if you try to oversimplify, you try to boil it down to, let's say, uh, its baser parts uh, analysis, uh, you're inevitably going to get to a situation where you're boiling it far too far, uh, far too much, and you're going to have too little to actually work with, and you are missing out important ingredients, important context for a trade. In simpli uh, simplifying, which I know a lot of people do, they don't simplify their trading uh, until it gets to uh, the situation where they say, oh, well, I have technical and fundamental analysis that everyone says that I should incorporate my trading. You know what? I'm going to simplify and just go for technicals. And then they go off and pursue the very complicated technical uh, techniques like uh, GAN wave analysis or Elliott wave analysis or other fractal or uh, multivariate analysis. And that is only simplifying uh, on one, one plane. It's actually detrimental because you're adding complication without the proper filter. I've talked about uh, why technicals and fundamentals are each other's best complementary uh, techniques for analysis. All right, they're the most uh, separate evaluations you can make of a market. So don't oversimplify in that way. Otherwise, you're not doing yourself any good. You're just creating significant detriment. You're essentially uh, flying blind in the market. But let's take a look at a couple of uh, of examples uh, when we're talking about complicated versus simple. First, let's talk, start with complicated. Complicated was going into the UK election and presuming to pick a pound view. Now, after the fact, it seems relatively straightforward, and, and actually after the fact, it is uh, much more simplistic. But going into that actual uh, election, as we talked about in the trading video that preceded the uh, the event, uh, we had a number of possible outcomes and a significant amount of gray area uh, in the scenarios. So you could have, let's say, a conservative uh, majority, which we didn't find, uh, or we can have a loss of that uh, uh, that majority. And then we have what we now know as a hung parliament. Uh, now, hung parliament, is, it, that seems black and white, but hung parliament carries a lot of unknowns and a lot of uh, variance to it. And clearly, we have a strong break to the downside for the pound, but does that even guarantee follow through? It, it depends on things like uh, whether the prime minister is going to step down despite her initial uh, initial view of not doing so. Uh, how does this change the negotiation position for Brexit? Uh, are they going to be obstructionist uh, in the uh, smaller parties? Uh, there are too many unknowns to be very confident in this being a simplistic trade. Now, I'm not saying you, you can't trade it. As long as you know the, the moving parts and you have clear views on those moving parts, or at least you account for them, uh, then that's perfectly fine. But this is not a simple trade, and I don't want it to be viewed as being simple. Simple. Another currency pair, which I know a lot of people really love, is the dollar yen. It has produced some very significant swings, and in time, at times in the past, it has been relatively straightforward, uh, being a simplistic currency pair to trade. And that's because we were really focusing on monetary policy, but that, this is not that time. There are complications here, and while they are not necessarily uh, many complications, they are significant enough that we don't know at any one time whether the market is going to provide value for one of them versus the other. And the issue here with dollar yen is that we have relative monetary policy, obviously an enormous consideration uh, for dollar and yen because uh, when we look at them on the uh, spectrum of monetary policy, we know that they are at opposites. The Bank of Japan being one of the most dovish central banks, the Fed being one of the most hawkish central banks. So that is a, a critical factor. Of course, it's not just where they stand now, it's how they move relative to each other and relative to time. But there's another factor here, risk trends. As it happens, dollar-yen uh, is very much aligned to risk on, risk off. Yen crosses in general will drop in risk aversion. They rise in risk on because it traditionally follows the carry trade. Not a lot of carry nowadays, uh, but uh, it's still 
uh, has that kind of influence. But we also have to add to that, that mix the U.S. dollar, which has been treating it as a early adopter carry currency. So we're not very far into its uh, current hawkish rate cycle. They've only just started to lift rates. But we know that the markets have really uh, front-run expectations of capital flowing into the U.S. to take advantage of those, uh, those increases in rates, which are going to in motivate slow moving capital uh, to into U.S.-based assets and subsequently lift the dollar. But this increases and intensifies the, the disparity in what we're following. Now, as it happens, if there's a big drop in risk trends, uh, it's very likely the Fed is going to, to throttle its, its tightening cycle and subsequently this provides amplitude, leverage. Uh, but if you don't appreciate the dual nature of the fundamentals behind dollar yen, you would miss that uh, there are complications that you might get lucky in risk aversion motivates and overrides, uh, but you can also get very unlucky and think that fundamentals are broken. I hear that constantly. Fundamentals don't work. It's not that fundamentals don't work, it's that people don't appreciate what's actually motivating the masses. Now let's talk about something that's relatively straightforward. How about the dollar? Uh, the dollar going into the Fed rate decision next week. I know this has uh, come with some degree of, uh, of of complication, or at least presumed complication from, from traders, but it's been relatively straightforward. Its decline is in part due to throttled monetary policy views, uh, but also uh, curbed re uh, reach for, for yield. Uh, now, I know that seems unusual with the S&P 500 pushing record highs, but uh, there is not as aggressive an appetite for things uh, that uh, provide any and every uh, basis point worth of return. Uh, they're, much being, they're being much more uh, finicky about what they actually take into a portfolio. And U.S. dollar, or U.S.-based assets, has only a marginal rate of return above zero. And that is not enough to really draw that kind of interest, so we've pulled back. Now, heading into the rate decision that we have this coming Wednesday, uh, this is a relatively straightforward situation. It's not just uh, the rate hike, all right? The rate hike is where the ba the baseline is. It might seem complicated, but uh, no hike versus a rate hike, uh, that's not where this is being defined. A rate hike is almost fully priced in from the market's perspective, so that is the cutoff. This is where the discussion starts. If there's no hike, there's no discussion. We're talking about a dollar and an S&P 500 drop because it's uh, evidence that uh, the confidence has significantly uh, dropped from what was previously expected. But rate hike merely meets expectations. That's why the view of that is neutral. From there, we go into the details. This is a quarterly event, but really it boils down to what the forecast for interest rate expectations are. If we have a third rate hike projected through 2017, so sometime in the second half of the year actually seeing another rate hike, that is bullish dollar. If there is more than that, that is bullish dollar. Why? Because the markets aren't accounting for it. They think it is a low probability, and thereby if we do reinforce it, it raises probability, raises the dollar. And it's pretty straightforward what's motivating the dollar. All right, so this is actually a pretty straightforward event, although it seems complicated. And of course, we can find uh, from a recent past, Aussie Cat, another Aussie-based cross. And this is a cross that you probably, many of you probably haven't even looked at before. Uh, but this is straightforward. We neutralize a lot of those uncertainties, like risk trends, like uh, commodity prices, like trade considerations. All of those are neutralized because they're in the same spot, same position. What we pay attention to instead is genuinely how the relative economies are doing. And we had a very abrupt Aussie CAD drop through Friday, and that was in large part due to the release of the Canadian employment figures, which were very strong. So we know one thing that we can look at. We can just keep tabs on the docket and say this is probably going to have a significant impact if it's a high degree importance uh, indicator for that particular currency, either the Aussie or the CAD. That's a pretty straightforward means of trading. 
removes a lot of the complications. I don't have to think about wrist trends. I don't have to think about trade protectionism. I don't have to think about uh, China or one of the superpowers and what it does to this currency versus its counterpart because they're all in the same. They're both in the same boat. Simplicity. All right. So as you go through these markets, I know you're going to come across a really a, a tempting or appealing uh, technical pattern, like a pound yen. All right. But don't just jump into this currency pair because there's one element, all right? And certainly don't try to dive down a rabbit hole chasing a extremely complicated and multi-stepped uh, trade. So I know a lot of uh, S&P 500 bears out there who are plotting out the uh, minutia of an eventual reversal through a, a great financial crisis redux. But that's too complicated and unlikely therefore to uh, take to take root it will happen eventually but what's the likelihood that you're going to be uh, jumping at the exact time it happens very unlikely all right keep it simple but don't throw off things that are important all right we'll wrap it up here i hope you have a fantastic weekend until we speak again i wish you good luck trading out there